Are we live? Yes, we're live. Welcome. The warmest of welcomes to you, to those who are here in person, and to those who are watching online. We are here to spend these days together, um, trusting that our time together will encourage our hearts, lift up our hearts, help us to look beyond ourselves. We hope that these days will be reminders to us that we exist to give God glory. We don't exist to pray for revival, although we pray for revival. We exist to give God glory. This is our third annual autumn conference, or for those of you who need to be culturally adapted, our fall conference. And we've been encouraged by the numbers that have come and those who are watching online. Maybe this is your first encounter with Westminster Presbyterian Seminary. I don't like using the word theological because the word seminary means a theological college. The word seminary from the Latin seminarium means a seedbed and our great aim in this theological college and this seminary is to be a seedbed, a nursery where men can come and be equipped under God to be preachers of the gospel of the grace of God and to be pastors to the people of God. We believe passionately that ministry is not simply about preaching, it's about caring for the flock of God. And that's what we exist to do as a seminary. Well, of course, the aim of the conference from one minor perspective is to introduce you to what Westminster Presbyterian Seminary is. And I hope you'll take the opportunity in the next couple of days to find out more of what we're about and what our vision is here in Newcastle. But more importantly, we want to serve the wider church. We want to remind the church as best as we are able of those great truths that the church of God needs in every generation to be reminded of and to be recalibrated by. It's so easy, isn't it, in the midst of the struggles, the battles of the Christian life to lose our focus. Sometimes just getting through a day can be a great triumph. I think we underplay that. You know, at the end of the day, if we are still found in Christ, trusting in the finished work of Christ, resting alone in the blood and righteousness of Christ, that's a great triumph. But we do want in this conference to remind ourselves and the church of God beyond ourselves of those great truths that God has been pleased to bless throughout the ages and to remind ourselves that the church of Jesus Christ <clears throat> is a supernatural body. <clears throat> My students have heard me say this perhaps too often but I love Benjamin Warfield's one of his definitions of a Christian, a Christian is an unembarrassed supernaturalist. We believe in a God who invades history and power and manifests his grace, his mercy, his love to the whole world. And we hope in these days of conference as we think about revival, what it is and perhaps what it isn't, that we will go away with this resounding conviction by the grace of God, we are unembarrassed supernaturalists. So we are here to worship God and we will do so as we sing the words of the 100th Psalm in the Scottish Psalter. It's towards the end of your blue books, page 362. It's the first version of the psalm. <clears throat> I'm sure it's a psalm that most of us know well. 
After we sing, I'll pray and introduce our first speaker. So please stand with me as we sing to God's praise. All people us pray together. <clears throat> our great and our gracious God, our Father in heaven, we bow in your presence. You are with your Son and the Holy Spirit, a great God and a great King. You are enthroned above the heavens and the earth. You are from everlasting and you are to everlasting. You are the one before whom the unfallen angels veil their faces and cry ceaselessly, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with your glory. And we come before you now, not with veiled faces, but with unveiled faces, united to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. In him, Lord, you have given us not only access to you, but acceptance with you. And not only acceptance with you, you have adopted us as your sons and daughters into your family and made us heirs together with Christ of your glory. We are, Lord, by your grace, the most blessed, the most privileged of people. And we come at the beginning of this conference to seek your blessing. Without your blessing, Lord, we have nothing. It is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. We pray that you would warm cold hearts, that you would calm distempered minds, that you would lift the fallen, 
that you would humble the proud and that you would lift up the humble. Draw near, Lord, to those whose lives have been bruised and broken these past weeks and days, who have come to the conference seeking your face, longing that you would meet with them in their need. And beyond ourselves, Lord, we pray that this land in all its darkness and misery and vileness might know times of refreshing from heaven. We pray, Lord, that you would remember in mercy the cause of your kingdom throughout our land, that in wrath you would remember mercy, that you would come, Lord, and cause your church in a new way to so live and declare the unsearchable riches of Christ, that this land might be shaken and many ushered into your kingdom. Lord, remember us, we pray. We especially remember before you Sue and Alan McCabe from the Ely Church in Cardiff. We pray for Sue, who had this stroke en route to the conference yesterday. We ask, Lord, that you would be with her in hospital, be with Alan, their son John. We ask, Lord, that you would draw near to her and that they would all be conscious that underneath them are the everlasting arms. Lord, how thankful we are that our times are in your hands. So we look to you today. We thank you that we have in your Son a great and an ever-gracious Saviour, one to whom we can run in all our times of need. So be with us, Lord, we pray. May your face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Warren Peel. Warren and I have been friends for many years now. He's the minister of Trinity Reformed Presbyterian Church in Newton Abbey in Northern Ireland. Uh, he is a dear, dear brother. We, we serve together on the board of the Banner of Truth Trust, and he's been a great addition uh, to the board these past years, and we're delighted he's here today to open the conference for us. Welcome, Warren. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ian, for uh, your welcome. It is uh, a privilege uh, and an honor to be invited to preach uh, at this conference. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege, isn't it, just to be at this conference, but uh, especially to be invited to uh, be one of the speakers. Um, is it all right if I move this microphone out of the way? Oh, right, okay. Is it okay if I move it that way a little bit? Uh, that's, that's better. Uh, I ask you please to turn with me in God's Word to Zechariah chapter 4. I want to begin our conference by turning our attention to verse 6 of this wonderful chapter, Zechariah chapter 4. As I was thinking and praying about which text to preach, for the opening sermon of a conference on revival, uh, my mind kept coming back again and again to this verse. It seems to me to be really the ideal verse uh, to speak about revival from, and perhaps every single one of the speakers at the conference will have a different text, and they will say exactly the same thing about that text, that it is the ideal text and no doubt uh, we'll all be right, but certainly the Lord has uh, laid this one 
on my heart. But we want to read it in its context, and so we begin reading at verse 1 of chapter 4. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it, and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl, and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall, bring forth, he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, Zechariah 4 verse 6 is a very well-known verse, isn't it? But perhaps the context in which this verse is found is not so familiar to us. As we've just read, it's part of the interpretation of a vision that was given to Zechariah by an angel. And so you can't really understand this verse on its own without understanding something about this vision in which it comes. The vision is described for us here in verses 2 and 3, and then some extra details are added in in verse 12. Zechariah sees a golden lampstand that is being fed with olive oil from two trees that are on either side of it. This lampstand seems to be a, a tall golden base that has a, a large bowl at the top of it. Uh, and around the edge of this bowl, there are seven lamps burning, being fed with the olive oil that is inside the reservoir of the bowl. On either side of the lampstands, there are these two olive trees with golden pipes running down from the overhanging branch, each supplying copious amounts of oil into the bowl. The oil is gushing down, it's pouring down from the trees to keep the bowl filled. The lampstand is a symbol of God's people the church. That's a very common picture throughout the Bible. It may be a picture of more than that, but I don't think that it is less than that. And so, very simply, the message of the vision is that God is supplying His people abundantly with all the resources that they could possibly need so that they can shine brightly. Uh, there are seven lumps around the edge of the bowl 
Uh, and, and seven, of course, is a picture, a symbol for fullness. In fact, uh, each of those seven lamps has seven lips, so it may in fact be a superlative of fullness, seven times seven, complete fullness. They're shining out beautifully, brilliantly, radiantly in the world. And so verse 6, it seems to me, sums up the whole vision. It's the key verse of the chapter. Let's just read it again. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The oil of God's Spirit is being poured constantly and copiously into the church, empowering her to live for God. It's a tremendous word of encouragement and comfort and hope for the people of God, not just in Zechariah's day, but for us, the church, the people of God today. And I'd like us to look at this verse uh, under three simple headings. First of all, we see here the need for strength. The need for strength. Nothing was more urgent in Zechariah's day because there was an enormous, demanding, and seemingly impossible task that was facing the people of God. Do you see how it's described in verse 7? It's like a mighty mountain, an overwhelmingly massive obstacle, something that is daunting, something that appears to be insurmountable and immovable. What is this mighty mountain? What is this obstacle? Well, you remember the context of this prophecy. Zechariah is preaching here to that small number of Jews who came back to Jerusalem out of exile in Babylon. And they came back to the very, very difficult task of rebuilding the infrastructure of the city and of the whole country after 70 years of neglect. The most important priority, of course, was to rebuild the temple which had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar 70 years before. It was just a heap of rubble. And the people came back, and they made a good start. The foundations of a new temple were laid. But then there was a great deal of opposition, you remember, from the neighboring peoples. And the work itself, for various reasons, was very hard, and the building ground to a halt. You remember how the Jews began to pour their energy into restoring their own homes and their own farms instead of the temple of God, and nothing was done for 16 years. And then God called the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to stir up the people to finish the work. That's the task that they're facing. It's no small task and they feel very, very weak. They're conscious, painfully conscious of their need for strength. And we can identify very much with that in the 21st century, can't we? We're conscious of the same need as you and I are called to build the church today because the work is hard for all kinds of reasons, and the opposition to it in our nation is increasingly fierce. And the task of advancing the kingdom of Jesus Christ, building the church, it often seems, doesn't it, like scaling a mountain. Perhaps sometimes we think that it would be easier to go and to climb Everest than to build the church. There's the state of our nation, for example. Last week in our church, uh, we had Kieran Kelly of the Christian Institute with us, 
Uh, and I'm sure that I speak for us all when I say how grateful we are for the work that the Institute does in keeping the church briefed on all the major ethical and political issues of the day and helping us to respond to them. But isn't it tragic that we need the work of the Christian Institute so badly? Because our nation has departed so far from its Christian heritage. Kieran was telling us last week about the work of the Legal Defense Fund and how 2,475 people have been helped just in the 15 years since it started. That is both wonderful and terrible at the same time, isn't it? That the law should be used increasingly to attack Christians who stand for truth in the public square. Who would have thought in the United Kingdom that a Christian would be in danger of losing their job or losing their business simply because they believe that marriage is for one man and one woman for life, or that your gender is the same as your biological sex. We're facing fierce opposition in the world. And it's bad enough when it's out there in the world, but of course it's not just out there in the world, is it? It's not just the state of the nation that makes building the church so difficult. It's the state of the church as well. When churches are not only condoning, but positively celebrating and endorsing and promoting gay marriage and homosexuality, when they're surrendering wholesale the Lord's day, when we're seeing in church after church, a massive loss of confidence in the Bible as God's Word, where where pews and chairs are being taken out and replaced with cafe-style tables and chairs, when, as one church that I heard of, has removed its pulpit and replaced it with a sofa, so that instead of the authoritative proclamation of the Word of God, we have a man or a woman at the front having a little chat with the congregation. How many churches in recent days have found that large numbers of their congregations simply haven't returned, even though COVID restrictions have long since been lifted? How many professing Christians are there today who have absolutely no problem with drunkenness, with sexual immorality, with divorce, with abortion, with transgenderism and homosexuality. There's no doubt at all, is there, about the need for strength, either in Zechariah's day or in our own day. We need strength because our circumstances are extremely demanding, and we are very, very weak. Or to put it another way, given the topic of our conference, we long for the revival, don't we, of spiritual strength. We long for God and His Word to be honored and obeyed in the church and throughout the whole nation. I've been rereading uh, in recent weeks uh, Arnold Dallimore's wonderful two-volume biography of George George Whitfield. And uh, at the beginning of that work, he talks about the state of England before the revival of the 18th century. And he talks about many of the same kinds of problems that we're seeing today. He talks about how biblical truth was being attacked by deists, who reduced God to a clockmaker, who simply wound up the universe, started on its way, and then left it to go off and to do other things. He talks about how that false teaching gradually infected the church so that it was accepted by the vast majority of the clergy. He talks about a nation that was in the grip of alcoholism because of the gin craze, making people, he says, cruel and inhuman and indifferent to the suffering of the poor. He talks about how crime and violence was spiraling out of control. You've heard it said, perhaps, that uh, the nation was heading for a crisis akin to the French Revolution. 
until revival came. And Dallimore quotes from the historian J.R. Green and says this, a religious revival burst forth which changed in a few years the whole temper of English society. The church was restored to life and activity. Religion was carried to the hearts of people with the fresh spirit of moral zeal while it purified our literature and our manners. A new philanthropy reformed our prisons, infused clemency and wisdom into our penal laws, abolished the slave trade, and gave the first impulse to popular education. And that's a pattern that we have seen repeated many times over and over, isn't it, throughout history. During the 1859 revival of Ulster uh, in Coleraine, the town where I was uh, pastor for 11 years, uh, there were open-air meetings that took place for weeks and weeks every night that were attended by thousands. The town hall was kept open all through the night until 5 a.m., so that people could talk with ministers about spiritual things. And even then, the people were reluctant to leave. Maybe we'll have that same problem here uh, in these days together. A daily prayer meeting met every morning at half past nine during the workers' breakfast hour. And normally, it was attended by a thousand people. That's a fifth of the population of the whole town. Drunkenness which had been a serious problem in the town, disappeared overnight. Crime in the area almost vanished. One eyewitness says that the superior officer of police who had work experience in most of the counties of Ireland claimed that he had never seen such a quiet town. There had been, in his view, a complete reformation in the habits of many people. The head constable with 18 years' experience in coal rain said that the petty sessions on the 17th of June, 1859, were the first he had ever attended where nobody was prosecuted for riot and drunkenness. Marvelous. And that's the kind of strength that we desperately need, isn't it? And desperately long for as Christians and as churches. But how does it happen? Where can we get this strength that we need so desperately? Well, first of all, Zechariah is told where this strength does not come from. And that brings us from the need for strength to think about the inadequacy of human strength. The inadequacy of human strength. What does our text say? It says, not by might, nor by power. Not by might, nor by power. These two words together describe human resources, everything that human power can do, human resources of all kinds. It includes military might, for example. So think in your mind's eye of legions and legions of highly trained crack troops, cutting edge military hardware, jets and tanks or chariots and horses, depending on the period of history. It refers to political savvy. That's might and power. Political savvy, uh, having the wisdom the intelligence, the the nice, uh, the far-sighted tactical and strategic planning uh, to, to see your plans through, the ability to get what you want through diplomacy. It involves things like eloquence, the ability to move people by oratory, to persuade them to change their minds, to win their hearts, to carry the opinion of the people, the charisma to gather a following and to create support. It involves money, the wealth to be able to make your dreams become a reality. All of that and much, much more is encompassed in these words, might 
and power. Now surely, if a ruler had all of this, he would be invincible. He could do whatever he wanted. He could, he could accomplish anything. And surely as, as Zerubbabel and the Jews thought about building God's temple, they must have longed for might and power. And they must have looked back longingly to Solomon's day when the first temple was built, to the might and power that was at their disposal then. They would have thought, for example, of how David and his army had brought peace to the whole region so that that first temple could be built without having to set guards, without having to be afraid of attack. And then you think of how all the, the top craftsmen in the world were brought in to work on the temple, men like Huram Abi, who could do just about anything with any kind of metal or stone or textile. Think of the labor that was available to build the first temple. Solomon had 70,000 men to carry burdens, 80,000 men to quarry for stone up in the hill country. The entire number of the exiles who came back from Babylon that Zerubbabel had at his disposal was 42,000, and that included women. Think of the money that Solomon had. David left his son vast financial resources with which to buy the best material possible, 4,000 tons of gold, 34,000 tons of silver. Remember how silver, we're told, was so common in Solomon's day that it was like stones on the ground. We're told that Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And of course, at the top at the head of it all, directing operations, you've got Solomon, the wisest man in the world. Talk about might and power. And surely Zerubbabel was tempted to think, if only I had that, if only I had even just a little bit of that, I could build God a wonderful temple in no time at all. If only I had Solomon's abilities and Solomon's gifts and Solomon's resources, I could do a great job here as leader. And maybe you're tempted to think along those lines as well. If only we had the resources that other churches have, those big mega churches, then, then we could do something great for the Lord. If only we had more might and power, that's what we need. If only our minister could preach like Martin Lloyd-Jones. If only he had that kind of learning and wisdom and experience. How could you build the church without someone powerful and mighty in control? And it's tempting for us to say the same kinds of things about ourselves personally, isn't it? If only I had greater gifts, if only I was a better speaker, if only I had read more books, if only I was more intelligent, if only I had a more dynamic, outgoing personality, then I could do something great for God. If only I had a wife if only I had a wife who excelled at hospitality and personal evangelism. If only I had a husband. If only I had a husband who was more of a leader, more of a speaker, more of an influencer of others. If only I was single and I didn't have to divide my time and my energy with family responsibilities. If only I had a better job. If only I had more money, if only I had more time, if only I didn't have this illness, if only I were younger, if only I were older, then, then I could do something for God. Then I could make a difference. If only I had might and power, or even just a little bit more might and power. And what is God's word to Zerubbabel? and to the church then and today. It's very clear, isn't it? 
not by might, nor by power, because building God's kingdom doesn't depend on human strength. All the might and power in the world put together in one great lump cannot advance the kingdom of God one single millimeter. That was the great mistake, wasn't it, of the revivalists of the 19th and 20th centuries. And perhaps we'll hear more about that uh, in these days. They thought that they could work up revival by human might and power. All they had to do was get the method right, and the results were assured. And so, Mr. Murray, in his book, Revival and Revivalism, writing about the period 1858 to 1958, when revivalism emerged, he says, seasons of revival became revival meetings. Instead of being surprising, they might now be even announced in advance. And whereas no one in the previous century had known of ways to secure a revival, a system was now popularized by revivalists which came near to guaranteeing results. And so as long as you've got all these different bits and pieces, the altar call and the anxious bench and the inquirer's room and the mood, the mood music, all these new measures, then human might and power will be able to secure these things. But our text could not be clearer. You can have all the might and power in the world, and you cannot accomplish anything by yourself. You cannot engineer revival. You can't convert a single person. You can't bring comfort or encouragement to a single saint. You can't build up one single Christian in godliness. You can't make people more prayerful. You can't make people hate their sin more and love Christ more. You can't do anything of spiritual benefit by yourself, by might and power. And surely we say, we want to object and say, well, now surely might and power could do something. But our text is clear, isn't it? No, by themselves they can do nothing, not by might nor by power. The church is not built by might and power. Don't worry about your lack of resources, Zerubbabel. Don't trust in your own abilities. That's irrelevant. The amount of might you have, the amount of power you have is completely irrelevant because it's not by might or by power the need for strength, the inadequacy of human strength, and then that brings us lastly to the source of true strength. The source of true strength. Not by human might or power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts, that title means the one to whom all the power in the universe belongs, the one who commands all the hosts, the hosts of heaven and the hosts of earth. Here is where power for building the, God, the kingdom of God comes from. Here's where we get the strength to repent and believe the gospel. Here's how we're able to resist temptation. Here's how you're able to live a godly life. It's by the oil of the Spirit flowing from the trees into the bowl. It fuels the lamps so that they can shine out in the darkness and give light all around. Zerubbabel and the people need to realize that if the temple is going to be rebuilt, what they need above all is not money. It's not worldly power or influence or large numbers. All they need is people who are humbly depending on God's Spirit for all things. And that is such an encouragement, isn't it, for people like you and me who, like Zerubbabel, don't have much might or power. 
with the exception of a very small number here, we're not very influential or clever or outstanding in any way. We are very, very ordinary. And the good news is that that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in the least. It couldn't matter less because it's by God's Spirit and not by might and power. By my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It was this Almighty Spirit who was involved in the work of creating the whole universe out of nothing. It was this Almighty Spirit whom God sent to open that path through the Red Sea so that several million people could pass through on dry land. It was this Almighty Spirit who swept through that valley of dry bones before Ezekiel, bringing them to life again. It's this Almighty Spirit who acts in human beings who are dead in their sin and gives them new life and enables them to repent and to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's this Almighty Spirit who is the author of every true revival in the history of the church from the day of Pentecost to the Reformation to the Great Awakenings to our present day. It is His work, and He sovereignly blows where He pleases and accomplishes His purposes. The source of true strength, not by might or by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Brothers and sisters, surely this truth ought to drive us to pray. If the kingdom advances through our might and our power, then we really shouldn't waste too much time, if any time, praying. If it's about our might and power, then let's get out there and let's do everything that might and power can do. But if it depends on God's Spirit, then surely prayer ought to feature much much more largely, if it doesn't already, in our personal lives, in our families' lives, and in the lives of our churches. I can't help wondering how many of us who would say with hand on heart that we believe this verse, that we would die for the truth of this verse, and yet we live as though it said the opposite not by my Spirit, but by might and power. How many of our churches would have to admit that the prayer meeting is the least well-attended meeting in the whole week? How many Reformed ministers among us can say that we give significant time each day to prayer? We're quick to condemn the revivalists and their dependence on gimmicks and techniques, but we have our own reformed gimmicks and techniques that we depend on, our own might and power in preaching, perhaps. Perhaps we're depending on the might and power of the coherence and the logic and the profundity of reformed theology. Our prayer lives individually and as families and as congregations are a good index, aren't they, by which we can gauge how much we're depending on the Spirit and how much we're depending on human might and power. And I say to you as I say to myself that if you are not a man or a woman of prayer, then you are not depending on the Spirit, whatever you might profess with your lips. You are depending on your own might and power or the might and power of someone else. And maybe your might and power is quite considerable as far as the world is concerned, but this text challenges us, doesn't it, that our might and power is utterly useless 
as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. We must pray if we believe this verse. And we must work as well. And perhaps that sounds contradictory. But just because the kingdom is not built by human might and power doesn't mean, of course, that we should just sit around all day and do nothing but pray. That would be a mistake as well. And of course, like everything, it's a mistake that some Christians have fallen into in the past. God uses our work. He uses our might and our power. He calls us to work but it's only the power of His Spirit that makes that work effective, isn't it? Uh, Paul puts it so perfectly. Well, of course he puts it perfectly. He's inspired by the Spirit. But Colossians 1.29, he says, I labor, struggling with all His energy, which so powerfully works in me. And that means that we will strive to do the work that God has given us to do in the way that He wants us to do, because it's not by might or power. This, this, this destroys all pragmatism, doesn't it? It, it? it keeps us from being lured into compromising in order to get results. If we're going to work, if it's by God's Spirit, then we'll use His prescribed methodology pray and work, because it's not by might or by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And what will happen then if people take verse 6 seriously? Well, look at verse 7 for the answer. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain." And he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. The people in Zechariah's day can't see anything except this great, forbidding, daunting, intimidating mountain that they have to scale. It's very demoralizing. But what does God say? He says, what are you, O mighty mountain? If God's Spirit is able to create a whole universe out of nothing, He can certainly deal with this little mountain, however mighty it seems to the Jews. It may seem, our mountains may seem impossibly big to us, but we've got to remember that they're not big to God. Verse 9, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. When we depend on God's Spirit and not on our own might and power, the mountains become level. And the problems that appear, appear to be impossible to surmount can be overcome. The Spirit of the Lord God Almighty is available to each one of us who is a Christian today to empower us to live for Him, to shine for Him, to glorify Him in everything. And how does it come, this Spirit of God, this oil? Well, verses 12 to 14 give us this picture of two messiahs on either side of the lampstand, two anointed ones. There's Joshua, the high priest, and there is Zerubbabel, the ruler, the king, and they are like the channels through which the oil of the Spirit flows to God's people, and through Zechariah the prophet who brings this word. And all three together are a picture, aren't they, of the Lord Jesus, our prophet, our priest, and our King. And it's through Him, it's through His life, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, and his session at the right hand of God, that he pours copiously, abundantly, the oil of the Spirit into our churches and into our hearts so that we can shine brilliantly for him. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel and to you and to me today. 
not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Well, let's bow our heads for prayer. Let us pray. O Lord our God, we come before You and we confess to You our preoccupation, if not even at times our obsession with might and power. We confess, O God, that we are attracted to it. We are seduced by it. We long for it. We long to possess it and to wield it. And so we worship you, O God, because you're the one to whom all might and power belongs. You are the Lord of hosts, the creator of the ends of the earth. And we rejoice, O God, that you give your might and power, the power of your Spirit, to fill your people, to fill your church, so that we might shine for you in the darkness. Lord, we pray that you will make us deeply conscious of our need for the strength that you alone can provide. We pray that you will forgive us for seeking it in other places, and we pray that you will so fill us with your Spirit that we would do great things for you, not because we are great, but because you are great and you give us strength. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we conclude this first session by singing some verses from the 18th Psalm. You'll find on page 21. We'll sing verses 27 through 36. One, two, three, four, five, six stanzas in all. Uh, Jonathan will play through the tune, then we shall stand and sing.
second session. Thank you.